Hey, so I'm a little under the weather because uh, I had to have a procedure done and so I'm still feeling the hangover effect of propofol. That's uh, anesthesia. But I wanted to do something productive and so you guys are going to get a little lecture. Um, something I would like to point out is all of this criticism of Stu McGill that I hear from people on a regular basis and it's interesting to me because it becomes very apparent that they've never actually read his work so people are like oh Stu McGill all of his work is on pig spines and that's actually not true so I encourage you to go read his work and go read his papers and take a look at the number of papers that he's published um, pig spines make up a very small percentage of his work and the thing is is that those studies are what's called a proof of concept so the point being it would be this should be obvious to you but perhaps it isn't so I'm going to point this out it would be unethical for you to take a human and bend their spine back and forth until it broke and that would be unethical and it would also be unethical for you to take a, a live animal like a pig and bend its spine back and forth until the spine broke. Um, we don't do things like that. That would be unconscionable. That would be unethical. That would be wrong. I think we can all agree that taking an animal or a human, uh, which is still an animal, but um, I'm differentiating because, you know, we don't feel so bad about rodent studies. The point being, you, you would not take a live organism and bend it back and forth until the spine broke unless you were really sick. So what you do is you take a cadaver spine and you use a pig spine because it's very similar to a human spine and you bend it back and forth and it breaks at some point. And what this does is this gives you a proof of concept. So it, it it's not saying, oh, because it bent back and forth and broke at the 80th repetition that this causes you to break after 80 flexions, you know. This is not like that. It doesn't work that way. Stu doesn't claim that. What it does, though, is it's a proof of concept. And so what it tells us is that if you bend something back and forth enough times, eventually it will break. It doesn't tell you the magic number. That could be 10,000 for you. That could be 100,000 for you. Who knows? The point is that if you bend something back and forth enough times, including a bone, it will break. And that makes sense because bone is a piezoelectric crystal, okay? Your bone is a crystal. It's made up of minerals. There's magnesium and calcium. There are minerals that make this up. So your bone is actually a crystal structure. And if you bend it back and forth enough times, it breaks. That's it. Like, Stu never claimed anything beyond that. And those studies are a proof-of-concept study. So... All it is doing is it's verifying the mechanism of injury. So it's saying the mechanism of injury is repeated flexion extension. That's it. But people take that out of context. And they're like, so what he's saying is, no, don't speak for him. Don't, when you twist someone else's words, if you have to make a straw man out of your opponent's argument, you don't actually have an argument. Like if I have to take what you said and twist it and spin it to make it sound stupid, you don't actually have a real argument. So, I encourage people to actually read Stu's work. Uh, Stu has made the point that, you know, if you're a ballerina or, you know, you're a gymnast, you need to be able to go into flexion and extension. But if you're a power lifter, right, this is a completely different sport, um, you don't want to be flexing your spine and then extending your spine repeat repeatedly you would want rigidity. So if your goal is to produce as much force as you possibly can with your legs to lift a barbell, you would want your spine to be as stable and locked in and rigid as possible so that you can produce force. This should be really simple. Imagine that you're squatting a barbell. In one scenario, you're standing on a BOSU ball, which is unstable. In another scenario, you're standing on a concrete floor. Which scenario do you think you'll be able to produce more force? Obviously the concrete floor. The stability, the rigidity of the floor allows you to produce more force. If you're standing in sand 
if you're standing on a foam mat, if you're standing on a BOSU ball, you're not going to be able to produce maximal force with your legs because the surface that you're pushing into is unstable. So similarly, if your spine is unstable and it's moving around like a wet noodle, you're not going to be able to generate maximal force. Like, it really is that simple. I don't know why this happens. I don't know. I feel like people just like to say something mean about someone else's work. But if you're going to do that, and I'm all for that, by the way, like, by all means, be hypercritical of someone's work. Um, we should. This is how science progresses. You need to question things. You need to read things critically. And you need to break them down. But here's the catch to that you need to actually read the paper then. You can't just read the abstract. You can't just read some post you saw on social media about the paper. You should go read the paper itself. And then if you read the paper itself and you actually have genuine criticism of the paper itself, by all means, levy your criticism. But if your criticism is, oh, all he does is pig spines, and it's like, well, where did you come up with that? Oh, I saw it on social media. That's not, a, that's not a scientific argument. That's not even a fair debate. So, I'm not defending McGill, and I'm not criticizing McGill. I'm just making a neutral statement here that if you're going to criticize someone's work, make sure that you actually read it before you criticize it. I feel like this is a very simple statement, but apparently this, somehow this is missed. Um, and that's, that's all I want to share here. I just want to share with people that uh, before you read something on social media, be mindful of the fact that a lot of these people levy criticism, and once you start talking to them, you realize that they've never actually read the paper. I find that to be intellectually lazy, and perhaps even intellectually dishonest, although sometimes I think people do it, and they don't realize that they're being dishonest. So I want to give people the benefit of the doubt and just say that they are... Um, this is mean, but I would rather assume that someone is incompetent rather than assuming that someone is intentionally dishonest. So, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's the better of the two. You know, I would like to think that someone is trying to be honest, but they're simply incompetent, rather than thinking that someone is competent and they're intentionally dishonest. So, and that's all I have to say on this topic. Just if you see criticism of something, um, you should go read the paper yourself, and you'll be shocked how many times the paper says nothing like the criticism that is being levied.